I am not usually a purveyor of malicious compliance, but I do enjoy reading about the exploits of others in this area. Back in the day, say about the mid to late 1990s, I was a field tech for an IT company. My teammates and I were contracted to an aluminium mill in the upper left hand corner of America. The place was huge. It's the only place that I've worked as an IT guy where I had to put on a hot suit to go in certain areas as part of my job. So one day I get this ticket for a computer that wouldn't turn on at the other end of the plant. So I grab a power supply and head off in the golf cart. No joke, this place was so big we had golf carts to get around. Important later is the fact that we used paper tickets with all the information for the callout printed on the ticket with space for us to write what was done, etc. We'd bring the resolve tickets back to the manager and he'd put the data into a wacky access database for tracking. I get out there and sure enough, the power supply is deader than mashed potatoes. I even test it with a multimeter to verify. I swap the power supply, machine powers up, I update my ticket, and off I go back to HQ. End of day comes eventually, and I hand off my fistful of tickets. The next day, I get some of my tickets back from a manager with a note, needs more detail. I point out to the guy that there is not much more detail to be had, using the power supply ticket as an example. Test power supply, test bad, replace power supply. PC powers on as normal. He wasn't having it though. He accepted the tickets back, but make sure that I understand that I need more detail on my tickets. Okay, fine. Later in the afternoon, I get a call for a bad floppy drive. Perfecto. This is the perfect opportunity to flex my budding technical documentation skills. I grab a floppy disk drive off the shelf and race out in the golf cart. Upon arrival, I do my normal test, diagnose, replace, update process, with the exception of adding excruciating details to the ticket. 1. Attempt read of two known good floppy disks. Insert floppy number one in drive, attempt directory command, unable to read disk. Remove floppy number one from drive. Insert floppy number two in drive, attempt direct command, unable to read disk. Remove floppy number two from drive. Power down system by pressing the power button on the front right corner, and so on. I did this for a total of 13 steps. The process documentation for the replacement of the floppy in excruciating detail took me about 20 minutes to handwrite, filling the entire front of the ticket as well as the back. At the end of the day, I turned in my stack of completed tickets to the manager with a smile and a wave. Back in those days, we had daily meetings each morning to discuss any gotchas that we needed to look out for, new dangers around the mill, upcoming maintenances, and other random stuff. The meetings usually lasted 15 to 20 minutes, and we picked up our ticket load for the day at the end of the meeting. In the technology world of today, it might be called a daily scrum or a daily stand-up. During this meeting, the manager begins talking about proper documentation of tickets. He holds up my masterpiece, displaying each side of the paper in all its glory, and plainly states that this is a bit much. Just note on your tickets, in a quick and concise manner, what the problem was and what you did to fix it. The whole time he was explaining this to the team, he kept looking at me, with that stupid eyebrow cocked up. I was so proud. Nobody ever got the business again for not being detailed enough on their tickets. 2. I worked for a large brokerage firm in their mutual funds division. My duties included working on special projects for the controller, coordinating with the users on any issues that needed to be addressed, and working on automating all processes. I loved my job, and I was real good at it. As I had these various tasks, I had two computers so that I could run the programs that I was modifying while still working on other tasks. As stated, I loved the work, since I basically did what I wanted to do with minimal, if any, supervision. Due to this, I regularly came in early, sometimes as early as 7 a.m., and staying as late as 7 p.m. I easily did two to three times the work of anyone else. 
I was always the first one in and generally the last one to leave. One day I took a lunch break, which was also rare as I brought my lunch and worked straight through. Unfortunately, I had some errands to run, and I ended up getting back after taking an extra ten minutes. I was summoned to my manager's office where he reamed me for an hour over these ten minutes. I had enough of this, and I asked him if he realized how early I got in and how late I stayed. His answer totally blew me away. He said, it doesn't matter how early you get in or how late you stay, only what happens between nine and five that counts. Cue malicious compliance. I stopped going in early. I would take a walk or read a book until 8.55 a.m. I would take a break mid-morning, take exactly one hour for lunch and another break in the afternoon. I would stop work at 4.45 p.m. and clean my work area. Exactly at 5 p.m. I would shut down my computers and leave for the day. He never said anything about this as he knew he brought it on himself. All that resulted in this is he lost over five hours of work a day from me. Not long after this, I left for brighter pastures, at an increase of total compensation of almost 100%. It was possible as I went to a very high-scale investment firm. Later on, I found out they had to hire three people to do my work. Like they say, you don't know how good you have it until it disappears. 3. I boarded my 14-hour flight from LA to Shanghai and settled down in 62H. There were four seats in the middle of the plane, 62E, F, G, H. My 62H is the aisle seat on the right. On my left in 62E and F sat a mother in her 50s and a son, college age. Between me and the mother, there was 62G, empty. As boarding came to an end in a rare chirpy mood, I leaned over and said to the woman, Hope the person doesn't come so we both have more elbow room. No response while she fluffed the synthetic little pillow in the empty seat. I didn't think much of it. As soon as boarding as complete was announced, to my surprise the woman moved to the empty seat next to me, effectively moving the elbow room from between us to between her and her son. The next thing I knew she was pulling the upright armrest divider between us down. Still surprised, to her I said, Why? More space for both of us with it up. She obliged in silence, and the armrest stayed up. Still couldn't decide how upset I should be, though. Flight took off, and the seatbelt sign came off. I reached for my shoes under the seat in the front. Imagine my outrage when my left foot felt her foot in my area. Oh, woman. I see you woke up today and chose violence. One more attempt of diplomacy. As a good Asian woman knows the virtue of filial piety. Ayi, your foot is in the way. Ayi is a Chinese honorific title for older women. My underlying message was, aren't you ashamed for behaving the way you do as an elder? She pretended she didn't hear me. This is war. Next I did what any red-blooded American would do. I complained to multiple flight attendants. One went to talk to her while I waited from not too far away. With that woman sitting steadily in that seat, I knew no justice was upheld. Flight attendant reported back apologetically, The passenger said she has to sit there because there is something on her anus. Now, I failed to see the correlation between an empty seat and a hemorrhoid. But the impartial judge was ineffective. I thanked the flight attendants, plural, because... One intervened, and the other two handed me a cup of hot water, and then a cup of hot tea. A much memefied, futile attempt to show I care, and sat back down. At this point, I knew this street problem needed a street solution. You can't reason with someone who's willing to share and make up some anus problem just to win. My attempt earlier to shame her with an honorific title felt laughable. I'll just put my legs up on the seat when she gets up to go to the bathroom, I thought. Easy. Oh, the sweet summer child that was me. For the next twelve hours, I repeat, twelve hours, she did not drink water, did not lift up ever so slightly from the seat, nothing. She knew the consequences of getting up. She had done this before. This was not her first territorial war. 
I should add that she sounded perfectly normal talking to her son, a caring, pleasant mother. Early on, I heard the son say, Mom, why don't you move back over? And she went, Nah, don't worry about it. Chirpy, like my mood before she ruined it. I tried everything to tempt her to. I got up to use the restroom liberally. Look at this freedom that you too could have. With the two cups I got from those flight attendants, I transferred water from one to the other. Listen to this trickling water sound. While she was sound asleep, I turned on my overhead light. The bright beam just so happened to be directly off-center to her side. Waking her up felt good, but seriously, what was her bladder made of? Whatever it's made of wasn't turbulence-proof. After 15 minutes of genuinely terrifying turbulence, which probably led to a much-needed reassessment about her life choices, she got up and headed to the restroom when the plane steadied. I put my legs up across the newly freed seat. The son watched me from the other end of the row, next to a seat full of little pillows, blankets, and other accessories they got to accumulate. He said nothing. The woman returned, and having seen me sitting across two seats, to my amazement, she tried to sit down on my legs while murmuring, My seat, I need to sit in my seat, to the airway above my head. This can't be happening. With the unexpected butt to leg -like contact, I collected myself and said, Aye, shame on you, woman. You've been using this public seat for the last 12 hours. Don't you think it's now fair for me to put my feet up? Still making no eye contact, she jerked to retrieval and started rearranging these pillows and blankets next to her son. Fine, I'll make room for your feet. I'm not even feeling that well yet. I have to make room just so you can put your feet up. If Urena's problem calls for two seats... You should have purchased one more. I'm afraid you didn't. As I talked, she murmured, Stop! Stop! As my sentence finished, she simultaneously shouted, Stop talking! Everyone turned around to look at her. Somehow I thought this development was just the funniest thing and started laughing. It's been a week since my flight, and I still couldn't stop wondering how she would have escalated had I kept talking. With my legs up on 62G, I had the best two-hour nap of my life. I never saw them again after the flight. 4. So to give context, on Wednesday I went to the doctors and I was there for about two hours and a half. I had a fever, was throwing up, etc. The doctors just gave me nausea medicine. Then I spent another hour waiting for my medication to be given to me. After that, I spent 30 minutes waiting for the bus to arrive. At this point, I'm bound to look homeless, which really wasn't the case at all, since I had a hoodie and was literally covering every inch of me. I was shaking, tired, hurting from a fever. It was pretty bad that night. I dreamed I was a wizard creating cubes of magic in the dark. And it was cold. Really cold. Finally, my bus arrived and I took my seat. Immediately after, I was feeling sleepy, but you got me aft up if you think I'm going to sleep on a bus as a teenage girl. Listen, I was struggling. Every other second, I'd wake up and go back to sleep. I'd never sleep longer than three seconds. Anyways, this is where the actual story begins. During one of my wake-ups, this lady was leaning over to me. I couldn't see her face because I was wearing a hoodie. Since she was so close to me, I quickly grabbed my bag and lifted my hoodie. I thought she wanted to sit next to me because there were no other spaces. However, I saw that she quickly rushed to the back. I shrugged it off, but then I started to hear them talking about me. For context, I'm Hispanic. I speak and write Spanish, but I look white. Let's call these two one and two. One being to his friend and two being the lady I looked at. One asks two if I looked at her, to which she responds that I did, and she could tell I was on drugs. Mind you, they were speaking Spanish. Yo, when I tell you I had to physically hold my head in place to not snap and look at them, it's an understatement. However, I was tired, running on a high fever, etc. So I just texted my friends about these ladies as they continued to talk amongst one another about me. They kind of started talking more quietly at some point, so I couldn't hear any more. 
By some freaking miracle, one got off at the same stop I did. I didn't know what she looked like, but I knew her voice, and right before she got off, she was saying bye to two. Another two things that gave me a clue of who she was were also because when I got off, she looked at me. She had a disgusted face. And I, like a sassy teenager, looked her up and down and scoffed. Third clue being that every time I crossed the street, she crossed to the opposite side of me. However, I wasn't done. I got an idea. So I called the same friends I was texting earlier, and thankfully they answered. I put them on loudspeaker, and very loudly I started to talk in Spanish about the two old hags that had the nerve to judge people. I knew the lady heard because I wasn't being quiet. At all. And I know she doesn't mind her own business. Basically, I was stating loudly how I was in the hospital for four hours, and oh, how dare these people have the nerve to judge others, etc., etc. Midway through this, I crossed the street to be in front of her, and I basically started tearing her up on the phone. Not really, I'm not that mean. But I could tell she felt guilty because she stopped crossing the street. Then I got home, and my mom yelled at me for not saying anything during the bus ride. Mm. Also, I was on my period during this, so not only was I sick with something severe, I was bleeding and sensitive. Bro, why can't I suffer from one thing? I gotta suffer from the two? Five. I was renting a flat in the city. Never had any issues with the folks that lived one floor up. But they left and some absolute cockwombles moved in. They had a party on the Friday. I assumed it was a flat warming. That went on into the wee small hours. As a one-off, not ideal, but it's fine. Saturday, another party. I bang on their door, but they don't answer. Okay, they're having two flat warmings. Nope. Sunday evening comes round and loud music and shouting till like 3 a.m. This time I call the council noise team, who call the police. The music comes to a stop. Monday evening, party. Tuesday evening, party. Wednesday evening, party. Thursday were nights off and back to parties and shouting Friday onwards. This went on for a few weeks. The police and council were called by me and others in the building. About 4 a.m. one morning, I am woken by upstairs shouting down to someone in the street and banging on the door. Apparently, they had thrown their keys down so their friends could let themselves into the stair. But having not caught the key, started trying to break the door window with a small rock. As I leave for work, I look down and find a bunch of keys along with a prepayment electric key. I pick them up for... safekeeping. As I come home that evening, there's three or four people searching the bushes looking for keys. I smile, say hi, and walk past them. Open up my balcony door so I could hear them. Turns out they didn't have a lot left on their electric meter and can't top up without the key. About two days later, it goes quiet. I assume they ran out of electricity. I decided I really shouldn't keep their keys and didn't feel right to bin them, so I stuck them in an envelope, with loads and loads of glitter, addressed it to something like the twats, and put their address on it and stuck it into the post box. Since postage hadn't been paid, the Royal Mail would put a note through the door, and they'd have to trek down to the post office and get their letter filled with glitter and keys. Not long after, the landlord ended up evicting them especially as the owner of the property found out about all the noise complaints, and passed her number around and told folks to call her whenever they had an issue. Lord knows how many 3am calls she got. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge's Ice Cream, episode 343. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please hit the like button. That lets YouTube know you like the video and encourages them to recommend it to other people, which is something we really need help with around here. If you'd like early access to these videos, that's very easy to do. You can join me on my Patreon page, which is linked in the description. You'll get the videos there on Monday or Tuesday at the very latest. It is usually Monday. 
Helping support me on Patreon helps me do this for as long as I possibly can, as quite frankly, things aren't great on YouTube right now. You'll also find a link in the description to the Hellfreezer merchandise store. And if you really enjoyed this video, you can leave a tip by clicking on the little heart with the dollar sign underneath. You don't have to do any of that, but it really does help me a lot. Okay. As with no other business today, let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And I actually have one off the top of my head this time. Today's question is, what is the most unusual encounter you, as a customer, have had with a delivery person, any type of delivery person at all, be they takeout, Amazon, whatever, doesn't matter. I can cite mine right off the bat. Generally, I've got decent experiences with them, but this one was actually with a Tesco delivery driver. I used to, haven't done it for quite some time, but I used to get food deliveries from Tesco if I was busy with work or if I was too ill to actually go to the store. And I would generally tip the drivers with a five pound note because I like to be polite. Now, you don't really need to tip them, they do get a proper wage, but at the time money was a bit more flush so I was tipping them. And generally speaking it was, oh, thank you so much. Surprise, because most people wouldn't. Some people do, but not everyone. There was one guy, very nice, friendly, helpful as all the rest of the drivers. Kind of a tall, decent looking guy, kind of silver hair and a beard. He seemed suddenly very uncomfortable and shocked by the notion that I would dare to tip him. He kept saying, it's, it's a bit much. It's only five pounds. It was, it was only five. Was, yeah, but it's a bit much. Was it? Well, if you don't want to, then. He he did take it, by the way. But I said, well, if you don't want to, you, you, know, you don't have to. But yeah, he did take the tip. He just seemed very put out by the very notion of it, which is, pro <laughs> which is probably the most British reaction to a tip ever. Uh, anyway, that's mine. So why don't you let me know what some of yours are in a comment below. And before we go, let's have the answer of the day from a previous video. And this answer comes in response to, is a cheesecake a cake or a pie? And today's answer comes from, I apologize because I'm, I'm going to pronounce your name wrong, but I will do my best. Corvididia Corax 2991. And their answer is, cheesecake is a pie. But also, since it has cake in the name, people don't make a fuss if it is used in situations where cake is typically found, like they do with other pie. So my birthday cake is typically cheesecake, good choice, since I like it much better than actual cake. And thank you very much for your answer, Corvididia. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, you can hear birds chirping, it's that early in the morning now. Thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.